Red Roses go down. It's frost and snow and winter storm. Go down, get rid of the Red Roses. My name is Bruce Barnes uh, with the New Bedford Preservation Society. Tonight's tour is our whaling tour. That's, we're going to talk about the whaling industry through some of the houses that had sometimes direct connections, sometimes not so direct connections to whaling because of the subjects I wanted to cover. We're going to start right here, really, just for a brief thumbnail on the text on the uh, whaling industry. Yankee whaling was a big deal in the 18th and 19th centuries. And the reason it was a big deal was because whale oil from uh, the blubber of sperm and right whales was, was used as a lighting fuel. That was the reason why people went whaling, was to buy oil so that they could light their candles and their lamps and even their street lights at, at, uh, early on. Whale oil was very, a very valuable co commodity. And the original Yankee whalers were all from Nantucket. They developed the industry as, even in the mid-1700s, the things that they did as far as wages, as far as shipbuilding, as far as how to whale and so forth, which whales to catch and which whales not to catch, was all developed by Nantucketers. Um, and by the middle of the 18th century, 17, even as early as 1730 and, and, and 40, they had a very thriving industry. Even the wage system, which was called the lay system, or a share system, was developed by the Nantucket community because everybody in the community had some contact with the whaling industry and everybody got a little piece of it and they decided, they called it, I don't know why they called it lay, but they called it a lay system so that even people who were, who were, had a, just a marginal interest in the share got a little bit of the proceeds. And that transferred to New Bedford when it, when commercial whaling came here. And commercial whaling came to New Bedford in the 1760s, 10 years before the American Revolution. Um, one, of the, one of the whaling families from Nantucket, the Roaches, came to um, New Bedford and started a business. And that business was the one that morphed into the largest whaling uh, community in the country. Now, most of the early whalers, all of the whalers, the whole community really of Nantucket, was Quaker. So it's kind of fitting and apt that we uh, start this tour at the Friends Meeting House because um, this meeting house was built with the proceeds of the whaling industry. Um, the Roaches and the Rodmans, they were the first of the big time whalers in New Bedford and they were the primary benefactors uh, of the uh, Friends Meeting uh, House here at this site as well as that one there. The yellow one was the original Friends Meetings House. It was on this site, actually. They just moved it over there when they built this one. The yellow house right there was the first Friends Meeting House, uh, 1793 or so. They actually moved it to that site. Moving houses, we, if you've been on all, any of my other tours, you realize how many houses in New Bedford, big houses as well as small ones, but big houses were moved on a regular basis. Hard to believe that they had the the, the technology and so forth and wherewithal to do it, but they did it on a regular basis. And that building is a, is a early, very early example of it. So um, that's the preliminary to the, to the tour. We had, uh, uh, we have, New Bedford is a, is a whaling community. By the early, uh, the late years of the, of the 18th century from 1760 on, and uh, lots of money coming in. And uh, that's, the, that's the introduction to where we are. 1790 or so, New Bedford's doing real well. The city's growing. Um, there's a large infrastructure already in the city uh, because when they started commercial whaling here, they had to have all the, all the enterprises that supported the industry, like sail making and blacksmithing, cooper, cooper or barrel making. All those people had to be here uh, to, to support the industry. I mean, and, and New Bedford really grew overnight from nothing as just a nice farming community there was a few whaling a few ships that did some some, some a few of the families did some shipping and so forth but anyway almost overnight it was transformed to a, a, a fairly important um, whaling port with even uh, uh, refining tech uh, wharf space and so forth the house behind me really is a very very attractive 
and historic building in this in its in its own right. You know, you look at it, it says, "Boy, I've seen a million of these," and you probably have. But this building is uh, um, the home of Humphrey uh, Humphrey Russell. Talk about him in a second. But it's just a nice example of the two-story colonial. Now, it's not a it's not classified as a colonial because it wasn't built during a colonial period. It's referred to as a federal now because it was built 1800 after you know after the country became a separate country. But basically, the houses just like this one were built all over the South Coast. You know, if you go to towns like Westport or, or Rochester, there's some there's a lot of really nice buildings of this example of this style built in the 1750s and the 1770s and so forth. So, and this one is a really nice, it's kind of hidden here. Nobody really even looks at it because it's on this busy street and so forth. But it's a really cool house, actually. And it's almost in its original condition. The back end was an add-on. I'm not sure when, when the back end was added on. But this is a very, very nice house. And it's the home of Humphrey, Humphrey Russell. The Russell family, Joseph Russell in particular, Humphrey's father, they were the first colonists to settle in what is now New Bedford early 1700s. Prior to that, New Bedford was unoccupied except perhaps by some uh, uh, Native Americans who maybe come here during during the, winter, the summertime to clam or fish and so forth, but basically it was, un, was unoccupied. And the Russell family was the first to move here. And over time, a number of uh, uh, landowners built uh, and purchased property here in New Bedford in these long strips of land. From, from the south end all the way to the north end, basically st strips of land from the, from the uh, harbor all the way out to Dartmouth, really, to almost probably Slocum Road anyway. And the Russells own this middle part right here, from like um, Allen Street to Kempton Street, more or less. The Kemptons own the next lot. The next lot. There, so all the famous names own the land on both sides. The Allens own the south end, like Allen Street. Hathaway Road, that's where the Hathaways own their land. So that's basically the, sort of the line of the original families and so forth. But the Russells own this center section here. And this is where the Roaches purchased property to develop the whaling industry. The National Park is basically, downtown, is basically the 10-acre lot that the, Russells, that the Roaches purchased from the Russells. The Russells actually, as a, fa as a even a farming family, were fairly entrepreneurial. They did some, they did some trade, coastal trading. They even built some ships and went out whaling. They didn't, they didn't kill, they killed the whales, but they brought all the blubber back. Not like the factory ships that were de being developed at the time. We'll talk about the ships later. But anyway, the Russells got very heavily involved early on with the whaling industry because they had capital from all the lots they were selling in this area to the new people coming to New Bedford to, to uh, get in on the industry. And they were, they were in early in, 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 the, in the business. In fact, in 1785, they had a ship built called the Rebecca, 1785, right after the end, a couple of years after the end of the American Revolution. They, they, had a, they built a ship called the Rebecca. And the Rebecca was a pretty famous ship because it was the first Yankee whaler to go around Cape Horn, the southern tip of South America, and into the Pacific Ocean. Prior to that, all the whaling that was done by Europeans and Americans was in the Atlantic Ocean. Actually, the English went there first about a year before the Rebecca. They were both at sea at the same time. But anyway, um, so all the, all the whaling was done in the Atlantic Ocean, and it was really kind of getting fished out, as it were. Not completely, but they were kind of worried about how many whales are actually going to be. But when the Rebecca went into the Pacific Ocean, it was a Russell ship owned by Humphrey Russell and his family in 1791, I think it was. They opened up for Yankee whaling, the whaling ground, the tremendous expanse of the Pacific Ocean where there was almost countless whales. Now, an interesting footnote to the Rebecca is that it was built by a shipwright by the name of George Claghorn. George Claghorn. And George Claghorn was an interesting guy. He actually was a patriot and militiaman, fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill in uh, <laughs> some fans that couldn't afford to stop. Um, that he fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill in uh, June of 1775. Another footnote, the Battle of Bunker Hill was the bloodiest war 
of the revolution. More British soldiers and American uh, patriots died at Bunker Hill than any other battle during the revolution. And it was a whole year before the Declaration of Independence. Anyway, Claghorn was injured at, the, at Bunker Hill. Comes to New Bedford after the war, and is a shipwright, it's a master shipwright. Bills the Rebecca, considered one of the best ships, whale ships floating at the time. He's hired 10 years later to be the shipwright for the USS Constitution. The warship Constitution, old Ironsides, still afloat. Um, and he didn't design the ship, but he was the, he was the overall constructor of the Constitution. Pretty, a very, very significant accomplishment because the ship is still sailing, still commissioned, um, and, and is one of the great uh, sailing vessels in history for the United States. The Russells were very involved in the industry. Um, after the, after the uh, Pacific uh, uh, Ocean was open to whaling and, and was realized the tremendous amount of whales that were there, voyages got longer, investment got higher, more and more whalers were built because, this, that, because it was really a very lucrative business, a very lucrative business. We'll talk about how much money was being made a little bit later in the tour. But uh, it made New Bedford a very wealthy place. For, and it ended up, originally it was owned by just a few people, all this money, but it spread quickly. And New Bedford was a very wealthy place. And that's why we have so many of those old monuments to the whaling industry, the library, the big stone mansions up on on uh, County Street, and a lot of the houses we're going to see tonight are as a result of the money that was brought to here um, by the whaling industries. This is the house here, right, that I I'm talking about. Again, it's, it's, this would be a half house to the one we just were at. This, because a full house would have two windows on this side and two windows on that side. This is a really cool house. This would be the type of house a whaling captain would own. We, you know, we, we, I'm sure that New Bedford advertises all the big houses on County Street and so forth as whaling, whaling captains mentioned. That isn't the case at all. Whaling captains never made that kind of money. They lived in houses like this and another pretty nice house we're going to see in a little while, but they didn't own the big houses because they weren't making that kind of money. I'll talk about the wage, the wage system a little later on. Uh, they wouldn't and, and, uh, own, this, own those types of houses. This is the type of house like this. But actually, this is a tradesman's house originally, a shipwright. This is a guy who built ships, who lived in this house. And it's here that I want to talk about the whale ship. The whale ship was only about 100 feet long. That's not very big. The average whale ship was about 105 feet long. Most of them were a little bit smaller, you know, they were about that size. That's not very big for a crew of 30 people. Um, if you go down to the waterfront now and look at some of the big, bigger uh, fishing vessels, they're, they're 100 feet. Some of the, the, the average size of fishing vessels are 100 feet. Some of the smaller ones are 70, 75 and stuff. But the average fishing vessel down on the waterfront is probably about 100 feet. And their crews are like five or seven, only five to seven or eight or so. It wasn't a very big vessel. Now, the whale ship was a factory ship. It was not built for speed. It was built to go to sea catch whales, boil down the blubber on the ship in what they called tripods. They had these tripods, big giant pots, black pots, two of them, where they cut the whale up, put it in the tripods, boiled it down to oil, and, and then uh, casked the oil and stored it and stowed it. And they went off to find more whales. That, so it was a factory ship. On the outside of the ship were davits or, or things to hang a whale boat from. The whale boats were attached to those, and they actually, when they, when they saw a whale from the masthead, the top of the mast, they would lower these boats with a crew of six, walk, and row out to the to whale, kill the whale, and tow it back to the ship. That was what it's all about. And then spend the next 24 to 48 hours boiling the thing to, to nothing, basically. A very gruesome and dirty business, to say the least. <laughs> but anyway, um, one of the, there was a, a librarian who worked in the library downtown, his name was Reginald Hegarty. And he was, he was actually, originally he was the bookmobile driver in the 40s and 50s for the library. But he was, his father was a whaler. And Hegarty knew a lot about whaling. And one of the librarians 
whose name was Jim Healy at the public library downtown. He recognized that Hegarty had something to offer other than just to be in a bookmobile drive. And they organized a, a whaling collection in, in the library. And, and Hegarty was the one who oversaw it. And while he was doing that, he, bought, he bought, wrote a book called The Birth of a Whale Ship. It's not the, not the most exciting book you'll ever want to read. <laughs> But it does show exactly how they were built, what their um, uh, functions were, where all the pieces of the boat went, where everybody slept, because 30 guys uh, in a boat that's only 100 feet long, that's not a lot of room per person. Um, and everybody had their own spot. We'll talk about the crews in a minute. But that's, so it was a, it's an interesting book, and he sort of codified all, the, all these details when you know, that type of knowledge was being lost because the last wooden whaler was the Charles W. Morgan, it's still at Mystic, and it wasn't here anymore. So it was a nice thing for him to do, to, to, uh, to describe how that happened. This is the house that I want you to, what I'm going to talk about here. Charles R. Tucker, he was a whaling merchant. This is where I'm going to start talking about how they made money on whaling. Now, the first though, I want to talk about the house. The house is very cool, actually. This is a, what they would refer to as a full Greek revival. Most times, the Greek revival is a half, it's either a giant mansion like the ones on County Street, or it's the smaller versions where you have, there's tons of them in, in farm communities, there's lots of them in Fairhaven, there's lots of them down by the Common Park, the small Greek revival. It's usually a half house. If you took those two things off, and then that, that would be what, it, what they looked like. There's lots of them around. You don't see too many full ones like with what like this. The Greek Revival is almost like a, uh, a a cape, but the gable end is to the street. That's the difference. And the ornamentation, like around the doorways and sometimes in the corners. I think the corner boards, a little like pilasters, were taken off this particular building at some point. But nonetheless, the, you could see how the fancy entryway and stuff is more of a Greek Revival ornamentation than than a colonial. But basically, that's what they basically just did, did some fit, you know fancy work on the front of the house and put the gable to the to the street you call it and that's what then you call it a Greek revival that's basically what it's all about this is a cool one though because there's not too many that have both two windows on either side that's a frame house big giant stone ones do but not the ones like this anyway how did they make money in whaling well there was a 70 30 split in the profits of a whale ship 70% went to the owners, 30% went to the crew. And it was all based on the lay system, even for the owners. But they didn't call it lay system for the owners, they called it shares. But um, the, the boats were, were broken up into shares. Early on, the big, like the Roaches and the Rodmans and the Russells, they owned practically the whole ship. It was like 100%. They, you know, you know, wasn't shared with anybody. But sometimes they would share it with some, even one of their, with their friends. It was sort of like an insurance policy, really. If you lost the ship, you didn't lose all your money, basically. That was probably why. But by the time Charles R. Tucker got involved in whaling, in the 1730s and 40s, there were lots of people getting involved in whaling. So that you'd have a guy owning, you know, a 32nd of a ship or a 16th of a ship. So, in, and you could see this, there's something in the library, the downtown library called Ship Registers. They have all the whale ships listed during this time. And they have all the shares that were owned by who and who owned them. It's pretty interesting, really. And an average whale, average whale voyage, a, you know, a successful whaling voyage could go from anywhere from like 120,000, which would be the very high end, to about 70,000. It was good money. I mean, they had to wait three or four years sometimes to get the money back, but there was a lot of money to be made. All of a sudden, if you owned a, a half a share in a whaling voyage, you might be taking home $40,000 when, when all of a sudden done. That was a lot. That was a real lot of money in the 1830s and 40s. Um, the crew, however, only got 30% of, of the, so when they got a lay or a share, say if their share was a tenth, which nobody got a tenth, but say, you know, theoretically, they would only get $3,000 because that would be a share of, of $30,000 30, in a $100,000 voyage. Not, a, not, not great money, really. You had to work your way up to get, um, to make money, but that's how it worked. Um, there was insurance that you could buy in case of a loss of a ship didn't pay a lot, but it paid something. But a lot of whale ship owners just figured that more ships, more shares, and different ships was their insurance. So that um, um, if they lost a ship, which 
the percentage of loss wasn't that great. It was about 2%. That's not really very high at all of losing ships. But nonetheless, if you did lose a ship, you lost a ship. It was, you know, it was a huge investment. Some people would, could be broken by the loss of one ship. But anyway, that's, that's how, basically that's how owners uh, made money. That's why there was so much money in New Bedford. If you had 10 ships going out and they were each bringing back to your coffers, you know, 20, 30, $40,000, like the Rodmans and the Roaches would have had early on, with a lot of money. You can accumulate lots of money in a hurry just with whaling, and that's, that's what happened. That's what fueled all the development uh, of the city was this tremendous income that was being generated by, by whale ships during, the sh during these years. The voyages were long, three or four years. Can you imagine being on one ship three or four years? The next, the next stop, we're going to talk about a, a, a man who, you know, in his life, and more or less the time he spent away, even a, in a short life, on a whaler trying to earn a living, uh, you know, but really three or four years uh, on a whale ship. I was thinking at one point you could have whaled, like you could have taken the voyage before the American Civil War and come back when it was all over. You know what I mean? That's how long the voyages were. This is a half house, like the second house we saw, 1820s, a little bit later. This is a captain's house. His name was Isaiah Burgess Jr. Um, a whaling captain. This would be a really a pretty nice house for a captain to own, actually. It's a nice building. Now, a little footnote on Isaiah Burgess Jr. His father, Isaiah Burgess, was the captain of the Beaver, which was one of the Boston Tea Party ships. Two of the Boston Tea Party ships were um, roach ships. William Roach ships. They were sent, the Roaches owned, the Roaches had what they called vertical integration of their business. They owned every aspect of the business. They owned the ships that whaled. They owned the ships that brought the product to market in London or, or France, for instance. They owned the refineries. They owned everything. They owned they, every aspect of the industry they, they owned. So, two of the ships that were in the Two of the ships in the Boston Tea Party, there were three ships at the Boston Tea Party that had the tea emptied from their holes, were uh, New Bedford ships. The Dartmouth and the Beaver were owned by the Roaches. And those were ships that were built, the Dartmouth was actually built in New Bedford in, in the 1760s. One of the first ships built what, with the, by the New Whalers. The Dartmouth and the Beaver were ships that shipped the oil to, to market, in this case, to London. They, they had a, a pile of uh, barrels of oil they brought to, to London, and then they had to bring something back to get their second commission, basically. And little did they know, or if they did know, they ignored it, that tea was an issue in the colonies, a big issue in the colonies. And so that was why they got involved. That's why it happened. The ships were held up because they had this tea, to, and, it was, and that was a big deal. And Isaiah Burgess was one of the captains. So anyway, now this, this is a story actually about Isaiah Burgess's brother, whose name was Paul, and there's a book called Whaling Letters. The uh, group in New Bedford called the Descendants of Whaling Masters has put together this book of letters, and this is where I got this story from. Paul Burgess, and this is this is we're going to talk about how the um, the whalemen, the crew, made their money. Um, let, let me just talk generally about that. As I said, there was about 30 members on each ship. And this is what they were. Captain, of course. There was three or four mates, usually three. Um, there was sort of the professionals in the group. They had to have a blacksmith. You had to have a, usually had a carpenter. Definitely had to have a cooper, cook. They had those types of people uh, as they were specialists that, that didn't, didn't do any whaling, but they had to be there on the ship to make repairs, to make harpoons, to make, especially to make barrels. A cooper was very, very important because he made all the barrels that were used to, to store the oil. And then you had all the, the seamen, all the guys who rowed, who did most of the oar work when you were rowing out to kill the whale. And each of those, each of these groups of, and then you had the boat, the boat steerers. Boat steerers was, was after, right after, as far as importance, right after um, the mates. And the boat steerers, or they were the guys who actually harpooned the whale to catch the whale. When, when, when a whale was harpooned, he wasn't killed with the harpoon, he was just hooked. It was like you were fishing and you caught the whale, but you hadn't killed him yet. 
He's, he was the one, who, but he was the one, very important job, he was the one who hooked the whale with the harpoon. Now, each of those jobs had a different lay. Captain probably had a twelfth or a sixteenth of a lay. So that's 12% of that, thir of that 30, 30%. The mates got 25 or so. The first mate got 25, like the second mate got 35, one thirty-fifth, and the, and the third mate might have got one thirty. One forty-fifth, and the professional people, as they say, like the cook and so forth, they get about a fifty-fifth. Now, all the seamen got about a one sixty-fifth, which was not very much money. If, if you, in a three-year voyage, a one sixty-fifth would probably get you of like three or four hundred dollars after three years' work. Now, Herman Melville, um, the author of Moby Dick. You know, he signed on a whaler in New Bedford in 1840, in the winter of 1840, December and January of 1840. And um, he signed for 165th, but he got an $84 advance, which I thought was quite a lot, actually, for the times. I mean, you know, four or $500 a year it was a living at back then. And he got an $84 advance. I thought that was quite a bit, you know, because they took that out of his, they would take that out of his, his income when he, when, you know, of his $300 when the voyage was over, if he went, if he lasted that long. And a lot of seamen didn't last that long. Um, but the seamen were the, four seamen were in each boat to do most of the rowing. The boat steerer did, did the rowing in the front. He stood, he was in the front of the boat and the, and the mate was in the back steering, actually steering the boat. So that, this is the scene, this is the scene with the crew and on a whaling, um, uh, cat, uh, a ray, uh, kill. The masthead says, there she blows. The, um, the mate or the captain says, lower away. Everybody gets in their assigned boats because the, 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 mate, the, the first mate has his, his, his crew and boat steer and so forth. They get in their boats. They're lowered into the water. They all row out. But the boat steer is in the front, the front part of the boat. The 30 foot the whale boat is 30 feet long. Um, he throws the harpoon to, to catch the whale. In some for some strange reason, and I'm not, and I don't know why they do this. The mate and the boat steerer switch positions while this irate sperm whale is trying to get away. Sperm whales don't like to get killed. You know, they're very, very ornery and, and, and not happy about getting harpooned. A lot of the, 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 the right whales are pretty docile, you know, and they're easy to kill. Sperm whales aren't like that. They don't like to be st stuck with a, with a harpoon. So while this is going on, the line is running out of the boat because the harpoon is attached to a line, 3,000 feet of line, and the, 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 the uh, whale is running out. They switch positions. That's why the boat steer is called a boat steer because he's in the back of the boat. And when the whale finally tires out, they pull close to the whale and the, and the mate stabs the, boat, the whale to death. That was the way it was done. And then they towed the whale back to the ship for process, for, for the other, the pot, boil, you know, what I just talked about a few minutes ago. That's how it was all about. Now, Paul Burgess was the first mate in 1927 of a ship called the Chelsea of New London. And he was on a 31-month voyage, and he had a 128th lay, and his pay for those 31 months was $1,820. Not a lot of money, it seems, but, but he had ambitions. And so... His next voyage, and he was married, had his child, like for the first, for the first like three or four years of their marriage, he was only home for seven months. Had two kids, but he was only home seven months. Takes another voyage, but, he, but with his money from, from this voyage, $1,820, he's going to be captain of the next voyage. He's going to get a 16th, and he also puts $500 down for a 16th share in the ship. That's a potential for him of a, maybe a $10,000 payday when he, when he comes back to port. Uh, unfortunately for Paul, he's killed while uh, chasing a whale, which happened more often than you might think. With this line going back and forth and so forth and it's switching positions, because captains would often hop in the boat and take one of the boat and, and go with the boat um, and do the whaling himself. You know, he'd take a crew with him. Instead of the mate, he would go in and, and, uh, and go on the voyage. And like, if, if you've read Moby Dick, that's how Ahab dies. He's in the boat and a foul line 
as the as the as the as Moby Dick is rushing away, Fowling goes around his neck and yanks him out of the boat and kills him instantly. That's what happens in Moby Dick to Ahab. He's killed by a, a bad line, and that's probably what happened to Paul Burgess, because that happened to another. When I was doing a, I did a talk on whaling uh, uh, history last year, and I was and I was doing a house. It was in the, um, um, it was a house like like this one, but it was in the. Uh, uh, Cushion Heights area down by the park. And it was a guy who was named Prince Sherman. He owned the house. He was in the house. And that's what happened to him. It said right on, right in the description of the, of the Form B, actually, that Prince Sherman was, was, uh, uh, yanked out of a boat, uh, as he was chasing a whale and was killed as a result. So it happened a lot, this, this bad accident. Um, anyway, um, but Burgess died. Um, I, I, I hope it doesn't say, in in the in the, the letters and, and the abstract that goes along with the letters, if um, Mrs. Burgess got her one sixteenth, we should, should have gotten one sixteenth of the voyage proceeds, hopefully, because that would have meant probably on an average voyage probably meant five to seven thousand dollars. So anyway, so that's how that's how they got paid. If you made no money on the voyage, then you made nobody made money, but um, usually. Uh, if you were a mate, you had ambitions to go up the ladder and eventually become captain someday. So you were willing to make those make those choices of whaling for spending your whole life at sea, basically, to get to the point where you're captain, so that you could make a better living. We got two stories from this site here. First is um, uh, the Cape Verdean uh, con contribution to the whaling industry, which was significant. The Azores and the Cape Verde Islands were one of the first stops that whale ships made when they left New Bedford to start a cruise for two reasons, especially in, especially in the Azores, was to pick up fresh fruits and vegetables. That was very, very important um, because if you left off season, for instance, you probably didn't have any fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables on hand. So you went to the Azores, even though it's ba basically the same uh, latitude as New Bedford, but it has a tropical climate, fairly semi-tropical climate. So you could buy fresh fruits and vegetables there and also pick up crew. Now even if you read Moby Dick carefully, he even says that Mo even on his voyage, even on the voyage of the, the Pequod, not in his own voyage, but his voyage on the Pequod, the book, the, the, the ship in the book, that more than half of the crewmen, the men who did the rowing, were islanders or, or Azorians, probably. It doesn't say Azorians, but that's, he has a sort of a, a, a Portuguese name for them. It's just like islanders or something like that anyway. Um, but then they would stop at Cape Verde as well to pick up usually more crew members from the very earliest years. Now, because Cape Verde Island is also a Portuguese was also a Portuguese colony. It's hard sometimes when you go through crew lists to figure out um, which ones are Azorian and which ones aren't. You know, but from the very early years, even in the 1780s and 90s, um, the Cape Verde Islands and the, the Azores were used to pick up crew and and fresh uh, food. Now, the Cape Verdeans were very well known as boat steers uh, for many many years. They had a very big reputation um, as boat steers, the guys who would who would hook uh, harpoon ears and would hook the whale originally. Uh, that's long standing. But as after 1860, whaling ceased to be a major um, uh, financial endeavor because the, the th things that were you, a whale was used for were over. over to, overtaken by the petroleum industry, which was, you know, oil was discovered in the fields of Pennsylvania in 1859, and kerosene came, was, was uh, discovered, not discovered, but created not so long after that. So kerosene, uh, uh, oil, regular oil, crude oil became, really put sperm oil out of the, out of the running. I and mean, when sperm oil continued, sperm oil continued well into the 20th century, but it was no longer the big money business that it had been. Uh, the last stop of the tour, we're going to talk about, you know, the last hurrah for big time whaling, which was uh, whaling for in the Arctic. But I'll talk about that in a minute. But whaling continued for a long period of time um, into the 20th century. And Cape Verdean sailors and captains 
became um, dominant in the industry. They were doing most of the whaling at that time. As a matter of fact, a man by the name of John Gonzales, who was a Cape Verdean uh, sailor, and he started out as a cabin boy in the uh, 1860s on, the, on a ship called the Roman, um, and he, and he rose through the ranks and became a captain. As a matter of fact, he was the last captain of the Charles W. Morgan in the, 19, in the early, uh, I think, like 1919, 1920, something like that. Um, and he, he was another guy. He was at sea for so many years of his life that it was hard to believe that he could have children and everything, but he did have a pretty good big family. Uh, but nonetheless, they sort of dominated the industry for many, many years um, as far as crew members and even as uh, owners of ships and captains of ships in, in the 20th century. Um, they were very important in the industry. I, you know, in, in Moby Dick, for instance, um, the boat steerers in Moby Dick are all non-white people. One's a um, uh, gayhead Indian or uh, an Aquina Indian, which we'd call him now. One is a uh, South Sea Islander, Queequeg is a South Sea Islander, and Degu was uh, an African. But it's, it, it's unlikely, actually. I mean, he could, Degu could have been uh, a fugitive slave and stuff, but he's not identified like that. He said he's from Africa in the book. And nine times out of ten, he had to have been, Degu had to have been, to me anyway, a Cape Verdean. He just had to have been, you know, because that would be more logical. But he doesn't identify him as such, so who knows. But anyway, it's kind of interesting that all the boat steerers in, uh, in Moby Dick are, uh, are non-white. It's, it's interesting. I think that's Melville's uh, statement on, on uh, his feelings about things. Um, so that's, the, you know, that's my sp talk about uh, on the Cape Verdean. It's very important. A Lady of Assumption Church, it's the heart of the Cape Verdean community, one of the oldest Cape Verdean parishes in the country. This building was built in the 1960s, early 60s, maybe 1960, um, and uh, just a very important, really a very important cultural building in the city. Any questions about that? Now, across the street is the um, Jewish synagogue. It's not that anymore, but that's what it was originally built as, the Jewish synagogue. And, excuse me, it's, a, it's still a church, but I think it's a Hispanic church. Yeah. Um, and 1922, 1922. Um, the Jewish community in, in, in New Bedford in the late 19th century got involved in the whaling industry. They ended up owning lots of small businesses, retail businesses on the waterfront and they sold uh, outfits to the last of the whalers. And they were pretty active in that. Um, they knew the waterfront pretty well. As a matter of fact, I've been wanting to tell this story on the tour for a long time, so this is one of the reasons why I do this. One of the, one of the wharf rats, Jewish wharf rats in the, in the teens and 20s, his name was Morris Cedarholm. And he was, um, he was, he was, his parents were one of the merchants that sold goods to the whalers. Uh, sold uh, clothing and shoes and so forth to the whalers, and, but he knew all about the waterfront. And when I talked about Reginald Hegarty being part of the library uh, during the 60s uh, a few minutes ago, one of the things that Mr. Hegarty did was he tried to interview the last remaining um, people who had anything to do with the whaling industry uh, in his, you know, they were still alive. And in the 1960s, there were a number of people who had gone whaling. Still, they were still alive. And one of those men was Morris Cedarholm. And, uh, he, and the library had real, the small reel-to-reel -reel tapes of all these interviews that he had. But the one with Morris Cedarholm was absolutely entertaining, really. He was so funny. He was, uh, he was hilarious. And one of his stories about whaling at the end was this. The whale ships, there was just a handful of whale ships left, the, the Charles W. Morgan, the Wanderer, and a few others. Um, and, and they hadn't been maintained. They were still whaling a little bit. But there was no money to maintain them. They had barely enough money to outfit them for a whaling voyage, you know. So they were, they were filthy in the inside, especially the, especially the quarters where the crew uh, was slept, which was in the front of the ship. The, uh, the, the very front of the ship called the forecastle or the forecastle was where um, the majority of the, of the sailors slept and all of the seamen, all the people who pulled the oars. And he said, you know, that area was so filthy, it was filled with bed bugs. So he said, but... Everybody had, a, everybody had a solution to the bed bugs, according to Morris Cedarholm, and that was to sprinkle cockroaches in your, in your bunk. 
the cockroaches would kill and eat all the bed bugs. And it was much, much easier to live with cockroaches in your bunk, in your bunk than bed bugs. <laughs> he was so funny when he told this story. I was just out like laughing when I was listening to it because it was so funny. Yeah, cockroaches were better than better than bed bugs um, for your births. Oh God, can you imagine how bad it must have been? This is uh, 34 South Sixth Street, one of the great mansions built during the early years of the whaling industry, 1830s. Um, this, this house had been occupied by a lot of people, actually. Um, and in, in the early 1870s, it was occupied by a man by, by the name of Frederick S. Allen. And Frederick S. Allen and his partner, uh, J Jira Swift, had, were one of the major whaling, uh, whaling firms during that time. Now, after oil was discovered in Pennsylvania, um, whaling took a turn as far as their uh, emphasis on where they whaled and what products they were looking for. And the main product that they were trying to get, other than oil, they still went after oil and stuff, but the main thing they wanted was the baleen from bowhead whales. Um, the bowhead whale is a right whale that's mostly in the Arctic Ocean. They were kind of fished out of the eastern Arctic off the coast in, in in Canada, on the eastern part of Canada, and in, in, in Greenland and so forth. There weren't that many bowhead whales anymore there, but there were lots of them in um, beyond the Bering Sea on the coast of Alaska and also on the coast of Siberia. So after 1860, that was the place where, you, where they went whaling. Um, it was a short season because the ice in, in these areas would be so impossible to penetrate um, and you had to wait for the ice to break up and then you could go into the spaces between where the ice would break up off the coast of Alaska in particular. And the bow, they just would follow the bowhead whales into the ice where they broke it up because the bowhead has to find open ice as well so he can breathe. By the way, before I forget, the bowhead whale, you should if you look this up, you'll see it even on Wikipedia. The bowhead whale might be the oldest living thing on the planet. It lives to 200 years old, according to scientists. 200 years old. So the story I'm going to tell now happened in 1871. It's possible, if, these, if that is correct, that there's a bowhead whale swimming around off the coast of Alaska that managed to avoid the whaling fleet, fleet of New Bedford in 1871, 200 years old. Anyway, the bowhead whale, um, they would follow the bowhead whale into the ice. You know, they'd tr track them around and so forth. Now, um, this, is the, this is how the Arctic whaling went at this time of year, at this time. It was a one, basically not even a one-year voyage. The idea was to get in into the whaling grounds just off the coast of Alaska when the ice was drifting away from the, from the shore, do as much whaling as possible, and get out as quickly as possible. So the whaling season was only about, a, only a few months long. Most of the ships were based in San Francisco. They would, they would, they would sail to Hawaii to get crew and to uh, outfit the ships. And then they would leave, they would leave Hawaii in early May or late April to go to the whaling grounds. And by the time they got there, the ice would be starting to break up and so forth. So that was the schedule. A fleet of 40 vessels left Hawaii in the late, uh, late spring of 1871 to go whaling. We've done this often over the last 10 years or so. Um, they owned four of the ships. Swift and Allen owned four of the ships. So they go up there, they start whaling, and um, the natives tell them, you shouldn't be whaling this year. The Yankee whalers and the natives had a very, very dicey relationship. You know, They kind of relied on each other a little bit, but they didn't really like each other very much. So you know, the, the whalemen said, ah, you know, these guys don't know what they're talking about. They just want us to go away, basically. So they start whaling, and the weather factors of, 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 that they anticipate and have and have resulted every single year 
was that the pack ice breaks up at the end of the summer. An easterly wind blows the, the pack ice just enough offshore so the, so the whales can get in there and, and feed and, get, and have plenty of space to come up for air. And the whalemen just follow them in and start killing the whales. Well, in this particular year, the whalemen get to those, these points where they really are starting to whale, finding a lot of whales and stuff. But the wind starts blowing the pack ice in the wrong direction. And before long, they realize they're going to be trapped. They won't be able to get out. 33 of the ships are in this area. Seven ships are still outside the pack. They haven't come in yet, and they, probably, and they end up not coming in. But 33 of the ships are in this area whaling, but the pack ice is, is not blowing away from the shore. It's blowing the pack ice toward the shore. And ships are starting to wreck because the pack ice is crushing them like, you know, like a cracker, basically. And before long, they say that they realize they're going to get trapped. How are they going to get out? You know, they can't winter there. It's, it's bad enough. The weather is bad enough in September when they decide to leave. It's bad enough in September. They couldn't possibly, not enough food to overwinter because, um, you know, they would, they would just freeze or starve to death or both. So they decide, we got to get out. They send out, in the, in the 30 foot whale boats, they send out scout ships to, to, to paddle their way over the ice. You have to drag the, the boat sometimes to get out to see if those seven, if there's the seven ships, they know there's 40 ships that went on the voyage and there's only 33 of them, you know, where they, they were spread out over like 50 miles, but they knew where each of them were. So they send out a scout ship, a scout boat, to see if, they, if, there's, if the seven are still out there to try to rescue them. Well, to make a long story short, there are seven ships out there that haven't come in yet. They say, look, we're going to abandon the fleet. You're going to have to take... Now, the ships are already pretty crowded with 30 fleet each. You're going to have, these seven ships are going to have to take 1,220 people on, on these ships. Or, or, you know, and they all decide that's what we got to do. So they pile as much food as they can in these 30-foot 30, these 30 whale boats, pile all the people in the boats, and over a period of a couple of days, everybody gets out on these whale boats. It's a miracle. Nobody, is, nobody dies, nobody gets hurt, but all the ships are abandoned. 33 ships are left there with, you know, and then the ships that are outside that had been whaling, they have to throw everything, all the product overboard because there's not enough room, you know. One of the ships, they... They, all of them except one are crushed by the ice. When they go back the next, they go back whaling the next year, just like they did before. And there's one ship just, just sailing around, completely intact. But the rest of them are all gone, crushed by the ice. The, the, the natives burned a few, um, for whatever reason. But basically, they were crushed by by the ice. But all 1,200 people escape going on these, these whale boats out to the, the seven that are, that are still out there. Now, two of the seven boats, one of them is the Lagoda, which is the boat that's at the whaling museum, is the model of the whaling museum. And if you went on my tour when I did the historic district, the, one of the other boats is the Progress. The Progress was a ship that was refitted to be the city exhi uh, exhibit at the Columbian Exhibition in, in 1893. So the Progress and the Lagoda, two ships, that I was quite familiar with were two of the rescue ships. They were two of the rescue ships, yep. One of the ships that was a rescue ship had to take on 250 people. Now, this is a ship that could barely hold 30, 30 people and, and some of the others. So, but all seven ships took 1,200 people safely back to Hawaii. Um, the loss, though, the financial loss to people like the Swifts and George, Ho George and Matthew Howland was enormous. Um, and um, some of them recovered. There was an interview in a book about this with one, with actually Jewish Swift. And he said, you know, what about the, the disaster? How'd you, how'd you survive that? He said, well, we had a little bit of insurance, but you win some, lose some. That was basically his, his attitude. He was pretty nonchalant about it. But the Howlands, whose house we just passed here, it really almost, almost bankrupted them. Um, they, felt, they felt, though, they kept on doing this. They felt this is a, a weather anomaly. It's never going to happen again. But five years later, the exact same thing happened, and 20 more ships were lost. That 
bankrupted a number of whaling firms um, that never went whaling again because it was such a big, huge loss. But anyway, the Arctic disaster of 1877, there's a nice article on, online about it if you want to learn more about it, but it was a pretty, pretty heroic event. Um, one of the sad things about the whole thing was they had to let all those 30-foot whale boats go. There was like 150 whale boats. They were all piled up outside the, the seven rescue ships, and they just had to let them go. And most of the people were so sad that they couldn't, they, those are the things that saved their lives, but they had to let them go. Um, one guy, actually, one guy stayed behind. He thought he was going to salvage the ships. He stayed, but they didn't get his name, but he stayed behind and he told what happened to the ships, you know, how they, which ones broke up, uh, which ones were burned. The, the natives, you know, the native population, you know, the winters were awful, you know, awful for them. But it was a bonanza that year because they had, all the ships were full of food, all the ships were full of oil, all the ships were, were, had wood that you could burn. I mean, you could, you know, you could b basically strip the ships bare for, for burning all winter long. I mean, it was a bonanza for them for one year. But um, anyway, he said, when I stayed behind, he was still there when they went back the next season. Um, but he didn't get to salvage anything. He just came back with the rest of the crews. Anyway, that was one of the water sh or watermark, uh, water, uh, most important events in the history of whaling it was the Arctic disaster, um, a very heroic event for the crews uh, that, that survived as well as the crews that rescued. Um, and uh, there's a book about it, but it's also a very nice article on, online about it as well. That concludes the tour. Um, thank you. We're just up. Thank you. and snow and winter storm. Go down, you blood red horses.